Hello, my name is David Kenny. I'm the preacher for the Church of Christ in Wadsworth, Ohio. Welcome to Light from Above. Glad you can be with us. We're continuing our series of studies of lessons based on the 2013 Memphis School of Preaching Lectures about the New Testament Christian. And one of the things I want to point out to make sure that you, know, you understand that you know, I view preaching as very serious business. I may not be the best preacher out there, but I do take it very serious. And here is a walkway into the Memphis School of Preaching School, and they take that work very serious as well. It's an excellent school if you're looking uh, for an opportunity to learn, to uh, be trained, to preach the gospel, and that's something that interests you. I would definitely recommend that you speak to the Memphis School of Preaching. We have several other excellent schools of preaching as well, such as the West Virginia School of Preaching and others too. So I definitely want to encourage you, if that's something of interest to you, to make sure that you follow up and you have that information. You know, today's lesson is about the New Testament Christian believes in a literal place called hell, in hell. And that's, that's really a serious topic, and it's a serious lesson. And, and it's a Bible topic. It's a New Testament topic. Some places you may go to worship, you may not even hear about hell anymore, or you may not hear about hell as you recall others being taught about hell. There's a lot of different competing views out there, and some people don't want to talk about it at all. And it may surprise you to come to realize that Jesus spoke about the reality and the nature and the duration. All these He talked about hell more than anybody else in the Bible, and it's not even close. So when people say things like, well, let's talk about what Jesus talked about, and they say, well, let's not talk about hell, that's a contradiction because Jesus talked about it. And he was very plain about it, and he warned people. In fact, that's, that's the reason he came to the earth, to save people from their sins. And we say that, but along with that is the idea he came to rescue us from the punishment of our sins. And that punishment is hell. Now, notice this quote here from the lectureship book by Brother Dearman. This is what he says, and this is important to keep in mind. In Scripture, Gehenna is the word used for the final destination of the wicked. It is the word the Lord uses in the passage previously cited in the, from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 29 through 30. Peter used another word not found elsewhere in Scripture to describe the place where rebellious angels await the final judgment. It is a form of the word Tartarus, 2 Peter 2, 4. The place called Tartarus is believed to be the designation of the realm of Hades where all the wicked await the final judgment, while the righteous spirits await the final day in paradise. Hades is the general term used to describe the entire realm of departed spirits. And he's pointing out something that, you know, sometimes, depending on what kind of translation of the scriptures you're using, some of the older translations, the three words there, Gehenna, Hades, and Tartarus, some old translations just translate all three of those terms with our English word hell. And, and that could be confusing when you start you know, studying. And you really need to recognize, you know, when you look at the word hell in the Bible, which one of these terms is being spoken of? Because they are definitely distinct terms. And we need to keep that in mind in our study. And as we talk about you know, hell being a New Testament subject, we're going to look at three main points. The first one is that there is a place called hell in the Bible. And then we'll talk a little bit about a preview and we'll talk about you know, the authority. Who's the authority or what is the authority on how to avoid hell? And that's really important that we take uh, note of as well because people have all kinds of opinions about all kinds of things. But are they authority on it? Now that's a different matter and that's what we want to focus on when we talk about that point. Well, first of all, there is a place called hell. That's something that we need to keep in mind. You know, some people may laugh at it, they may scoff at it, uh, but Jesus definitely talked about it as being very real. In this passage, this is the one in the Sermon on the Mount that we alluded to in the quote before. It says, If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is profitable, more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you uh, to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. You know, some people, they ridicule the idea that there's a place called hell. But Jesus was very serious about it. I was watching an interview, a news commentator, is Bill O'Reilly, and, and he, was, you know, he was talking about this the video series, The Bible, which I'm not going to comment on that, 
But uh, he made the comment, I found it sort of interesting. He says, well, the stories like Jonah, they're just allegorical, meaning they're not, they didn't really happen. But if you read what Jesus said, Jesus was very specific. The story of Jonah is true. Matter of fact, Jesus alludes to the time that Jesus was in the belly of the fish, the great serpent, or a sea monster, you know, three days, three nights. He alludes to that as a way to refer to how long he is going to be in the tomb. And that's in Matthew chapter 12, 39 through 41. So when people mock, you know, the, the idea that there was a guy named Jonah, but they hold to the teachings of Jesus, they're inconsistent with that. In the same way, does Jesus believe that Jonah was a very real figure of the Old Testament who really lived? He also taught that hell is a very real place. It's a very real place that we need to be aware of. Now, now who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe these modernists, these religious people of today that say, oh, you know, that's just nothing. There's nothing to that. There's no, that's just a bunch of superstition. Or are you going to listen to what Jesus actually taught? Who's the real authority there? And that's something that we need to keep in mind. And it's something, to, a place to be avoided. You know, Jesus talks about, you know, if you have to remove body parts to stay out of this place, then do it. Now, I'm not saying that you need to cut your hand off or things like that, but that's the severity of this place called hell. You want to not go there. You want to avoid it. And that's something that, you know, we're going to see as we go and look at the idea of what is this hell going to be like? Well, Jesus gives us a sort of insight of what this place is going to be like in the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Now, this is in Luke chapter 16, and I'm going to read a few passages here. Uh, the rich man and Lazarus, they're not really in hell. See, this is where you really need to pay attention to the words. It's not Gehenna. Gehenna is what we you know, think of when we think of the word hell. They're actually in Hades, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But it gives us some insight and some very important things that we need to learn. Uh, first of all, some people say, well, it's just a parable. But it's not. You know, a parable was an earthly story that was used to explain spiritual truths. Well, what's the earthly story? I mean, Jesus would use a farmer. He would use the soil. Uh, he would use seeds. He would use you know, all vine dressers. He would use these common things to explain spiritual truths. Well, what would be true with this account? This story, there's not one. And, it, and also you need to keep in mind that even if you do hold the view, which I don't, that the account of the rich man Lazarus is a parable, you still have to recognize the things that are there are taught as true. And so we want to keep that in mind. In Luke 16, 23 through 25, Jesus makes this statement about the story that we're talking about. And being torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. There's a lot of things here uh, that we can learn. One is, you know, when we die, that's not the end of consciousness. We have memory. We remember. You know, there's people out there that are going around that will tell you that when you die, if you're lost, you, your soul sleeps. You have no memory. You have no, none of that. You're, you're sleeping. Your soul does. But that's not true. We can see that in here. Also, we can see that even though the body ceases to exist, the spirit, the soul, our eternal abode, our eternal nature, it still goes on. So we need to be mindful of that. And we need to you know, recognize that you know, even though some of these concepts are hard for us to understand, there's recognition there. Lazarus recognized the rich man. Abraham recognized the rich man. The rich man recognized Lazarus. So you know, there's recognition there after death. We need to keep that in mind as well. And, and there is no, you know, some people have this idea that you know, when you die, if you're lost, you're just annihilated. It's just, it's just done, and you're done with it. But that's not the case. That's not what Jesus taught. And we need to be mindful of that as well. Now, some people want to dispute that. 
they want to dispute. They'll say they have no problem with an eternal heaven, but they, they don't like the idea of an eternal hell. Well, like it or not, it doesn't matter. It's what Jesus taught. Jesus taught in Matthew 25, 46, and these, talking about the sheep and the goats at the judgment, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, some people want to say, oh, see, one of them is everlasting and the other is eternal. Those are two different terms. Well, they may be two different terms, but they're two different terms that are synonymous in English. And the other thing is when you get your Greek, your Koine Greek, and you look it up, it's the same word. So you can't say that hell is temporary, but heaven is forever. Jesus did not teach that. Now, hell is a place where petitions are unheeded. There's no getting out of there. There is no getting out of Hades and the torments. You read the passage through there, you'll see that. The, the rich man wanted out of there, but he couldn't. He could not get out. And it's a place where misery does not want company. You know, that's something that, you know, some people, they get upset and they think, oh, you know, if this person and my loved one's lost or something, I, you know, I don't, want, I don't want to be in heaven without them. And so they consign themselves to rejecting God. And that doesn't make any sense. The rich man there is begging for Lazarus to go back and warn his brothers, do not come here. You need to keep that in mind. We know that spirits don't return from the dead. We know that too. I know that's popular on TVs and movies and radio shows and on and on and on. But in Luke 16, they don't come back. That's something we need to keep in mind. There is no getting out. Also, their destinations are fixed. There's a great gulf he talks about in that passage. There's no purgatory. Purgatory is not in the Bible. And that's something that you know, we need to keep in mind. It's in the Apocrypha that mentions it, but there's no swapping of destinations from here. There is no such thing. Also, keep in mind, you know, along with that, the fate of the rich man is not going to change. It's not going to change. That means, you know, we have people that run around our towns. They, they teach a lot of different things that are contrary to the scriptures. One of the things that they teach is that you can be baptized for a deceased relative. And that deceased relative then can be saved. They call it baptism for the dead. Well, that is contrary to this teaching. There is no such thing as baptism for the dead in the scriptures. And that's something we need to keep in mind as well. These destinations are fixed. And it's sad that some people don't take these things more seriously now why they could do something about it. They wait too late. Well, what about the authority on avoiding hell? Well, if you look further in Luke 16, 27 through 31, we read these words. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Now, I find this particular, the, the phrases that are underlined very fascinating. Why? Because Jesus is on the earth. He's, he's a part, he's doing his earthly ministry. He has not been crucified. He has not been in the tomb. He hasn't come out of it. He has not been resurrected yet. And, and here you can look at, you can see, wait a minute. There is on the horizon going to be somebody who comes back from the dead. And notice he says that, even if that happens, some people aren't going to believe. Some people aren't going to believe. It's also important to notice that you know, the law of Moses and the prophets and all that was sufficient to stay out of this place. And that's something, you know, back then, that was something that was really important to note. So when we talk about, you know, Jesus, you know, Jesus died and he was resurrected. So we can know with confidence that when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father except by me, John 14, 6. We could have confidence that that is true, despite about popular culture and what they want to say about that. We know that it's true. 
but what are we going to do about it? Who are we going to listen to? Are we going to listen to someone who's gone through this and come out of it and told us? Or are we going to listen to the theories that people put out that they haven't had any experience about at all? Who is the real authority on how to avoid this place called hell? Well, it's Jesus. Jesus is authority. Jesus in his word. Jesus empowered his apostles to go and preach and write and confirm that word through the miracles that they had. And so we can know. You know we have layer upon layer upon layer of evidence that the Bible is God's word. And then if we follow it and we believe it and we trust in it, we can avoid this place called hell. But sadly, a lot of people, and it's tragic, it's tragic. Some people, they don't investigate. They may just go with whatever they're told. But the New Testament is very plain about this. And I know you'll have people, they'll say, oh, no, it's not plain. That guy doesn't know what he's talking about. But let me challenge you, just read it. Read the New Testament. You'll see it. That's what churches of Christ are pleading for you to do. Just read the Bible. It's not that hard. But will people do it? And will they follow what it teaches? Well, that's a different matter. You know, God loves you and he loves me. John 3, 16. Perfect love casts out fear. 1 John 4, 18. We don't have to be afraid of this place called hell if we're in Christ, if we're Christians. We don't have to be afraid of it. God doesn't want us in hell. Some people, you know, they teach the opposite. God doesn't want us there. First Peter, or excuse me, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. God wants everyone to repent and be saved. That is really his desire. But will people do that? Will people do that? You know, God is the one that has set up the terms of forgiveness. At the end of every one of our programs that I've made so far, we have what, you know, I put the roadmap to heaven. And, you know, I created the graphics and, and all that, but that teaching is from the New Testament. Those are the terms and conditions that is the plan. And some people say, oh, you know what? <laughs> that negates grace. If you have to do something, then God's grace is nullified, which is silly. If it wasn't for God's love, he wouldn't have sent his son. If he wouldn't have sent his son, we wouldn't have had this plan. If it wasn't for the grace of God, there wouldn't be a plan of salvation. We would be lost. We'd be lost. God has standards of holiness He's a holy God. He's a just God. If people are lost, if they're sentenced to a place called hell, it will not be because God didn't tell them what to do to avoid it. It won't be because God didn't love them. It won't be because God withheld anything from them. He sent his son. It'll be because we chose not to know, or we chose not to repent, or we chose not to obey. And it'll be our choice. It'll be the choice that we make. Make sure you make the right choice. Make sure you're familiar with that. So when we talk about you know, hell as a New Testament subject, you know, we talked about you know, there is a place called hell. And we talked about you know, this account of the rich man Lazarus. It gives you an idea of what hell is going to be like. And then we talked about how we can avoid it. You know, there's other ways that, other terms, that are used to describe what hell's going to be like. And these words are not any more comforting. You know, we think about the fire. You know, he said, you know, send Lazarus so he can just, you know, just cool the tip of my tongue because I'm tormented in this flame. But there's other words, other concepts that are used to describe hell, and they are not any better. For example, outer darkness. Outer darkness. You ever been in outer darkness? The closest I've ever come to outer darkness is in the bottom of a cave where they turned all the lights out, and you could just feel it. I mean, it was so dark. There was no light whatsoever. And I can remember before they did that, I was just a little boy with my parents. 
I can remember when they did that, they said, we are going to turn off the lights for a grand total of, I think it was 30 seconds. It wasn't more than a minute. And they said, we're only going to turn it off for 30 seconds. That's all that it will be. I went back there one time when they did this again, and they even went so far as to say, we all have flashlights. And they showed that because people panicked. They panicked. And, and, I, and when they turned those lights out, I could understand why. The darkness, when they did that, when there is absolutely no light, you can feel it. You can feel it. And believe me, after 30 seconds of that, not even 30 seconds, you're ready for the lights to come back on. We need to remember that Jesus is the light of the world. We need to keep that in mind. Out of darkness, the sounds that we'll hear, weeping, gnashing of teeth, Terrible. Who, who would want to have any part to do with that? Well, before I close, you know, I want you to understand just how serious this subject is. And I know there's people out there they will dismiss it, they will laugh at it and all that. And, you know, and can't help that. It doesn't change the truth of the matter. But here's something I want you to think about, about the severity of hell. And when you realize the severity of it, I hope it gives you the priority you need to get away from it. There's a passage in Revelation that I want you to think about. You know, some people have this idea that, you know, Jesus' kingdom is in heaven and Satan's kingdom is in hell. And some people have this contorted idea that they think that, you know, you know I could pick either king and either kingdom. I could, you know, I could be with those dull Christians, or I could live it up. I could live it up with Satan and his kingdom. And so I'm going to choose, and I'm going to follow Satan. But they are making a serious mistake. Don't make that mistake. Don't make that mistake. Hell is not Satan's kingdom. It's his destination. Notice this passage in Revelation chapter 20, 13 through 15. It says, the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You know that lake of fire right there? That's hell. That's the real hell. Death and Hades, that's what we were talking about back there with the rich man and Lazarus. Hades is where the rich man is at, and Lazarus was at. Now ask yourself, what kind of place is hell really going to be if what we just read about in Luke 16 is going to be cast into it? What kind of place is that going to be? Can you imagine how hot, you know, the... (laughs) How hot that's going to be? How awful that's going to be? Friends, don't make the mistake of thinking that hell is Satan's kingdom. It is not. Sometimes we use the expression, heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. And it definitely is. But some people may not realize that hell is a prepared place for unprepared people or a disobedient people, or a rebellious people. And the person who prepared that place for that punishment is God. It's not Satan. This is the place where Satan is going to go to receive his punishment. Remember God, his Son, the Holy Spirit, the Bible, and the church, they all, you know, they all want you to avoid this place. You know, it's, it's a serious subject. And it's not one that's easy to talk about. And especially when you know, you're talking to people and you want them to realize the danger they're in. And you try to really be emphatic and warn them, and sometimes they are careless about it. And they don't pay attention to you. And it's easy to become very discouraged because you care about people so much. You want them to obey the gospel. You want them to know the truth. You want them to avoid this place called hell. And you can avoid it. Don't make a mistake that will cost you your soul. Thanks for watching our program. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. 
There are many incorrect set of directions out there, and sadly, so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map. Don't even open their Bibles yet, and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns, on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion, or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people, or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then, once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And that, the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood, and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the road map to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey.